Thank you, Inga. Wonderful for that reading. Um, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Just going to grab a stand, which Rick is going to provide. Brilliant. So we are uh, in the last of a series that we've been running through uh, the second half of the summer. We've been looking at the book of Joshua, uh, and it's called Moving Out. And we've been thinking about how uh, the people of God were called at that point in their history to move into and take inheritance um, of the land which God had promised them 40 years before when they'd been on the verge of the promised land. And uh, we're in the final of, of, uh, of this series, and here we are in Joshua 14. And finally, Caleb, one of, the, uh, one of the spies that were originally sent to check out the promised land 40 years before, has come back as they're on the verge of taking possession of Canaan. And they've said, okay, here's the bit I'd like to have. He's come to claim his inheritance, and he said, give me that hill. Except it actually says in, uh, the, uh, in, in one of the other translations, give me this mountain. And because I'm from Wales, I'm going to go with the mountain analogy. You guys in the southeast of England, we can have hills. But in Wales, where I come from, we have mountains. So we're going to be talking about that this, this morning. Give me this mountain. And um, I'm specifically giving a vision for St. Luke's Millwall. Uh, and there's a church plan which is going to take place there in, in January. And Fuzz and I are going to be leading a team uh, from here. Uh, so constituting, constituting some of you lot who are here today, um, who God is going to call, I believe, to come with us to help bring a new injection of life and a new chapter to St. Luke's. And it's, a, it's an amazing uh, church in an amazing part of London in the northern end of the Isle of Dogs. They're just in the shadow of Canary Wharf, which we can see uh, on the picture behind, uh, behind me there. And so I want to use Joshua 14 and what Caleb says to Joshua when he's waiting to, take, um, to, to go into the land as a window into understanding what this church planting business is all about and what it's going to mean for St. Paul's, for us as a church, to send a team from here over to the Isle of Dogs to restart St. Luke's. Uh, and um, as, as we do that, we need to kind of get to grips a little bit with, uh, with what's going on in this passage. And there's a background to what's happening here, as, as there always is in Old Testament scripture. So Caleb has come to Joshua, and he said to him, right, Joshua, you're in the process of divvying out Canaan now. You're, you're sort of allotting the different parts of this, this promised land that, that the Lord is giving to us. And you're giving them to each of the different tribes. And I'm here to tell you which bit I want. And you kind of might think, well, that sounds a little bit presumptuous. Um, surely, kind of, Joshua is the one that Moses has put in charge of, of taking the people into the promised land. It's really up to him, under God, to work out who gets what. What's Caleb doing here? Kind of as this upstart from the tribe of Judah saying, hang on a minute, I want this bit. Um, I, uh, this is the bit I want to have. Well, we need to understand a little bit of the history uh, of, of what was going on. So Caleb gives us some of, some of the information that we need here. And so he says to Joshua in verse 6, doesn't he? he says, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. So he's reminding Joshua that Joshua was a part of this. He was there. He was a witness of everything that had happened. I was 40 years old, um, uh, Caleb says, when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. So what was happening? If you want to flick back to uh, Numbers chapter 13 on page 143 of the Church Bibles, it'll give us more of the background to uh, what Caleb is talking about. Because So we're going back 40 years in time, and the people of God are on the verge of coming into the Promised Land at that point. And they decide what they need to do, which is a sensible idea, is to check out what the, what the situation is on the ground, to find out what the, what the land is like, and also to find out what the opposition is likely to be from the people that live there. God has promised them that they will have this land, uh, but they still need to find out what they're, you know, who and what they're dealing with. So uh, in, verse, um, in the first half of chapter 13, we find out who these spies are. There's a spy from each of the tribes um, 
uh, of, of Israel who are going to be sent to the promised land to, to check it out. And so we get the names of them and we find that Joshua and Caleb are amongst those who are being sent. And then Moses sends them out in verse 17 to explore Canaan and he says, go and have a look at it. Check out what the place is like. See whether, whether, whether the people who live there are strong or weak and find out um, wh- whether the land they live in is a good place to live. What kind of uh, facilities does it have, if you like? Has is it, is it got a good infrastructure in place? Um, and so they go. Uh, in verse 21, they go and explore the place and they find out that it's really fruitful uh, and they find that actually that also, there are some big people who live there. Um, uh, sort of, uh, sort of, it's a place which which generates um, strong, healthy people. Um, so they, they they take a little cutting of of these of this vine to carry back with them, and they go back and they bring a report back to Moses and to the rest of the Israelites. And what we find out is that ten of those twelve spies that had been sent to the promised land had forgotten a crucial thing. They'd forgotten who God was and the kind of God that he was. And as a result, when they went to the promised land, they saw something completely different to what Caleb and Joshua saw. We find that what, what the rest of the spies saw was, was that it was indeed a beautiful land. But in verse 28, they say, the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there and the Amalekites live in Negev. And, 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 and this Anak was like this, you know, this, this huge person. He was like, I guess he was a bit of a superstar, uh, um, you know, um, an, an old school rugby player, just somebody, that kind of person, that kind of build, somebody you just wouldn't mess around with. Those kind of people, it was definitely a descendant of, of, of him because they were huge. So they're trying to kind of paint a picture of the kind of people that lived uh, where they were going. And everybody's thinking, oh my goodness, this is, there's no way we can, we, we can go. This is obviously completely a crazy idea. And Caleb speaks against those spies. Uh, and he gives a different story. And he silenced the people before Moses and says to them, we should go up and take possession of the land for we will certainly do it. So when he goes and spies out the land, he sees something different. And uh, with regards to St. Luke's, and I'm going to be kind of interspersing the story of Joshua and Caleb with the story of St. Luke's and St. Paul's as well during today, um, what we find is that um, I've been looking around the Isle of Dogs for a little while, uh, and um, I've got my spies on the ground as well, people who are living uh, in that kind of part of town and who've been living there and understanding what the dynamics in the place are. Uh, and so we're getting a feel for what the Isle of Dogs is like, and we find that it's an amazing place. But there are some giants there, particularly these huge financial institutions that tower over uh, the Barkentine estate where St. Luke's sits, only f- maybe three or four minutes away. And yet they tower over it and they impose themselves on it as if they are kind of dwarfing this, and, uh, this, this community uh, and imposing this, this, this kind of corporate uh, life onto, um, onto the, the Isle of Dogs. And so it's quite an intimidating place. It can be quite an intimidating place to walk through to get to the Isle of Dogs. And as I kind of approach January, when we're going to plant the church, there are things that I could be intimidated by. There are things that, that, are, that, that seem like giants in the land, if you like. There are, there are significant things that we still need to overcome with regards to preparing for the church plant. There's this question of, of, of will we be able to, unfortunately, in the Church of England, church planting costs quite a lot of money. Um, and we can't, just, we can't just go and meet in a house. We, we, it's a blessing that we have this opportunity to, to, to reinvigorate a church that's been there for a, for a long time. But it brings with it a financial burden as well. And that means it's, I'm kind of thinking, Lord, that's, that's, a big, that's a big ask in our first year to be raising this sort of money. And I could be dwarfed by that as well. Or I could look with the eyes of faith. And as we stand on the, on the cusp of this, and we're beginning to spy out the land, I'm wondering as a church, 
what kind of approach are we going to have? Are we going to have the eyes of faith like Caleb who saw that this was the land that God had given to Israel, therefore he would do it. He would overcome God's enemies uh, and, and the people's enemies and, and he would give the land to the people. Or would I see the giants in the land? Zach's about to start nursery tomorrow. It's his first day in nursery tomorrow morning. He'll be going in at nine o'clock and he'll, he's just going to be straight in there. And here in Tower Hamlets, we don't do things by halves. It's nine till three every day. Um, and uh, we, we kind of negotiated a slight kind of, maybe a few weeks of just going to lunchtime. Is that be okay? Um, uh, and I think that's going to be all right. But Zach is on the verge of going into to this new environment. And I think, I mean, he doesn't actually really know a huge amount of what's going to hit him, but um, uh, I'm sure he's going to have a great time, but it's that sense of just of waiting for something to begin. And I can imagine that um, he might be feeling a little bit like um, Judah, who's our youngest son, conveniently named Judah, so Caleb from the tribe of Judah. I quite like that resonance. Anyway, Judah, that's not why we called him that, by the way. Um, I'll give you the reasons afterwards if you want to know. Uh, Judah um, was, was with us at the um, Paralympics on, on Friday. We went to see the Paralympics. And Judah was, was, got a little shot on the big screen, which we'll just show you here. Uh, and so here's, um, here's uh, Judah on the big screen. And uh, he's gone. There he is. So this guy comes, come, came up to Fuzz with a huge, great whopping camera and goes, do you want your baby on the big screen? And, uh, <laughs> nice of him to ask before doing it. And we were like, yeah, okay. So he goes, yeah, I've got a baby here if you want it. Uh, and um, <laughs> obviously they did. So uh, literally, two seconds later, Judas there on the big screen, and you can see the look on his face. Um, he's kind of sort of thinking, oh, what's going on? There's this huge, great big camera. It looks like it's about to swallow me up. And there's this great big kind of, oh, that goes around <laughs> the, the, uh, the Olympic Stadium as people aren't quite sure. Um, what to, whether he's happy or not. Um, that's his kind of, I'm slightly not, not sure face. And I can imagine that the whole tribe of Judah, um, not just Judah at the Paralympics, but the whole tribe of Judah might well have been thinking, oh, uh, not sure about this, as they face this prospect of going in to the promised land. But Caleb has a different view of things. So he comes back and uh, he brings a different report to the majority. Ten people come back and say, guys, it's a beautiful land, but we're going to get absolutely annihilated if we go there. We shouldn't go. And Caleb comes back, when with Joshua, he brings what you might call a minority report. Uh, the first ever minority report, probably. Um, it, which is, so that's a report which goes against the majority view. And so you might get it in, so in government, where you know, there's an official line from government on a, on a particular situation, but even within, within the party that's ruling, there's a differing view. That would be called a minority view or a minority report that's brought out. And that's exactly what Caleb does. He comes and he brings to, um, to Moses and to the people of Israel a minority report. He brings them a different view. And he says, no, it's, it's the majority, the, the rest of the spies, they're just seeing the obstacles. They're seeing that all the reasons why we shouldn't do this, they've absolutely forgotten two key events in our recent past. Caleb's say, saying, guys, they've forgotten the Exodus and they've forgotten Mount Sinai. They've forgotten who God is and what he has done. He's the God who delivered us out of Egypt. He brought us through the Red Sea, he parted the waters, and he brought us to Mount Sinai where there was fireworks, but like you've never seen before, there was, there was a lightning and there's the glory of the Lord that showed itself to, that, that, who showed himself to us. That is the God who is going before us. These spies have completely forgotten in, the, in, in that short space of time that's taken us to journey to the verge of the promised land and all they can see are the giants in the land and the obstacles that are to overcome. Haven't we, hasn't God already overcome so much for us? And as a result of, of the minority report, the Lord says to Caleb, you alone, only you and Joshua will see the promised land, will come into that place which has been promised to you. 
because of the, 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 the lack of faith of the Israelites, because unfortunately what happened was the Israelites sided with the majority, the majority view, and they said, oh, this, is, this is crazy, this is absolutely ridiculous, we, right, we mustn't go. And because of that, the Lord says, well, okay, you're not going to see the promised land then because you haven't continued to put your trust in me. But Caleb and Joshua, they're going to they're get there. They're going to experience what it's like to live in the place where, that I've promised them, a place where they're going to be blessed and I'm going to be their God and they're going to dwell in my presence. And the rest of you, unfortunately, are going to die in the desert. You're not going to see the promised land. I mean, they don't I mean, all die instantly. Some of them do, because they're like, oh, really? Okay, well, okay, sorry. In that case, we will go and attack. The, the, we will go and attack. And we were going to take in here, and we'll go and charge in. And, and they, as a result, because they're not going with faith, they're going because they, they feel stupid, essentially, and, and they know they've done the wrong thing. They do get absolutely um, battered, uh, and they leave again. And there's all sorts of problems and 40 years of waiting before finally we come to the point in Joshua 14 where they're about to go in. So Caleb had a minority report. Caleb saw something different. What Caleb saw was that God was great, God was glorious, and God was going to go ahead of them. God was going to bring them into the place that he promised and, and that means that he is able to come before Joshua and he's able to say to him, I follow the Lord my God wholeheartedly. And so in verse 9 of chapter 14 of Joshua, he says, On that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever. Because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. And then he says to Joshua, no. Just as the Lord has promised, he has kept me alive for 40 years since that time he said to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just in the battle now as I was then. Now, give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. He's come to claim his inheritance. He's come to claim his inheritance. And Joshua says to him, you're absolutely right. I was there. I know. I saw what you said. I saw what the Lord said. And this is your inheritance. You get Hebron. That was the place where his feet trod. It was the place that he spied out. It was, it was where his feet had, had, had trodden those 45 years earlier. And the Lord had said to him, you're going to have this place. The ground where you've trodden will be yours Mount Hebron, and it becomes a very significant place in the history of Israel from that day onwards. And so he gets his inheritance. Now, at St. Paul's, we, we talk a lot about uh, legacy, don't we? And uh, we talk a lot about uh, our vision to, to, to see the transformation of, um, of London, in East London, through the, the power and the love of Jesus. And we know that that means uh, making a difference in, in a whole generation. We want to leave a legacy. And another, another word for uh, inheritance is legacy. Another word for inheritance is legacy. And the thing with the word legacy is that a lot of time we might think about the word legacy and we think legacy is what you leave behind when you go. So, it's for example, when you die, you might leave a legacy uh, to somebody that, that continues for, um, for, for, for generations. But it's when you go that you leave the legacy. Uh, and, and so the problem with that phrase and that way of thinking about the word legacy is it, it tends to kind of um, overlook the fact that actually a legacy is something that you can enjoy right now. A legacy is something that you can be part of in the present. And what Caleb says is, I've come to claim my inheritance and my inheritance starts now, and it will go on for all time. And when we think about legacy for us as St. Paul's, I'd love for us to be thinking about something that not just we leave behind, so that um, whenever it is that God calls us on from, from East London or from, um, from this place, and it might be never, 
But for, for many of us, we know that, that our time in, in London is, is temporary for a whole number of reasons. Maybe we're here from overseas. Maybe, maybe we can't afford to live in this area. I'm praying that God changes that situation. Um, but for all sorts of reasons, people move on from, from East London fairly, fairly regularly. But that doesn't need to mean that we just think that leaving a legacy or having a legacy is something that we leave behind when we go. We can all be part of the legacy of this church, of St. Paul's. We can all be part of this legacy. And that's because the legacy that we're talking about is transformation. The legacy we're talking about is the transformation that God brings into people's lives and into whole communities. You see, what Caleb got and what his tribe, the tribe of Judah, got was a piece of land, a piece of land that God had promised. It was part of God's promise to Abraham many, many years before that he would be their God, that he would, go, that he would provide for them a land and that they would be a great people. This was the, this was the threefold promise of, of God to Abraham. He'd be their God, he would give them uh, land and they would be a great nation. And so what's happening here is the fulfillment of God's promises to many, many generations. And, that's, uh, and first of all to Abraham, that he would give them a land of their own. But that promise would find its ultimate fulfillment many, many years later, th- a thousand years later, when God would bless the whole world through Abraham's offspring, through the nation of Israel, in sending Jesus. And so what's, what Caleb shows us is the attitude of faith that enables him to come into the promised land, the land that God has given. How do we understand that? For us today, it's not about a patch of ground. For us today, it's about believing in the promises of God that were fulfilled in Jesus, that he has given us a new citizenship in heaven, that he has brought us into his kingdom, that we are now God's people, just as Israel was, was, was God's people. We are now all from different nations and different, um, different backgrounds. We're all together being brought into the kingdom of God. We've been brought into the church, God's body, the body of Christ. How amazing is that, is that truth? How profound that is. We're part of the kingdom of God. We're being given citizenship in the kingdom of God. And so when we think about claiming our inheritance, what we're doing essentially is thinking, how is the kingdom of God being birthed in my life? And how is it being birthed in the world around me? And so when we think about, um, when I think about St. Luke's and planting a church from here to the Isle of Dogs, what I'm asking the question is, Lord, how are we going to see more of your kingdom breaking out in East London and specifically in the Isle of Dogs, that couple of square kilometers of land? Because I believe that God is giving us the, the land, but not as a kind of possession where we can boot everybody else out and say, right, this is ours now. You, got, you guys got all got to leave because you're not part of the people of God. That's not what I believe. I believe that God is giving us that land as a place where we can speak about the transforming power and the transforming love of God. So the question I'm asking is, how are we going to see more of God's kingdom where he rules and where we see um, healing and where we see relationships being put right? How are we going to see more of that kingdom in the Isle of Dogs? And that is essentially the vision of St. Luke's. It's the same, it's going to sound very familiar uh, to you guys. The the vision of St. Luke's is to see the transformation of the Isle of Dogs through the love and the power of Jesus. And I believe that we'll see that as we go and we say, okay, we're going to claim this place. We're not not going to claim it in a kind of, in a a violent way by, by saying everybody else go, this is now ours. We're going to claim it by saying God loves this place. God has a, 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 his desire is that his kingdom rule, the rule of Jesus, would be established in the lives of people all over this island. 
And that's what we're praying for. That's what we're praying for. We're praying that we would see transformation in the Isle of Dogs as people experience the love of God and the power of God and then come into the kingdom of God. And we'll see it breaking out in different ways as well because the kingdom of God is about, is about communities being changed. We don't just tell people, guys, if you believe in Jesus, when you die, you'll get to heaven. That's not the gospel. The gospel is when you believe in Jesus, you will be made a new creation and you will start to see God's kingdom uh, rule and, and, and the new creation that God is bringing in your life. And you'll start to see it break out in, in the lives uh, of people around you and you'll start to see things change. So we proclaim it not just by um, telling people about the good news of forgiven sins, but we also, we also talk about good news for people who are in need. That's the gospel, is that, that, that the good news is for all people, especially those who are in need. And so we want to see um, broken families healed and restored. We want to see people who are struggling uh, in different ways, finding healing from addictions. People who are struggling in material ways, finding provision from the people of God. We want to see young people and children uh, experiencing God's love. We want to see school uh, um, pupils who are, who are thriving uh, and, and, and growing in, in their identity because they're in touch with God's kingdom, because God's people are there. This is the vision that, 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 that God's kind of, I feel, giving, giving me for St. Luke's, and it will sound familiar because it's the vision of St. Uh, Paul's as well. It's to see this kind of transformation. And so, finally... Um, As we think about claiming that inheritance, claiming the kingdom of God and proclaiming his love and his power that is available to all people, to the Isle of Dogs, what does that mean for us here today? How does that impact you? Well, first of all, the the first thing to say is we are a church that plants churches. It's just what we do. It's part of what we do. It's not everything, but it's, 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 it's a significant part. So because you're part of St. Paul's, that's part of what you do. And I'm afraid there's no getting out of that. It's, it's you know, you're here. Um, and uh, if you're, a new, new, and you're new or you're interested in joining, then you might be part of that. And we'd love you to be. Um, but St. Paul's is all about three things. Making disciples, transforming communities, and planting churches. And it's an amazing privilege to be part of a church. You know, I've, I've been here for three years, um, being trained uh, by Rick and by you to be doing what I'm about to do in January, to plant a church. It's amazing to be part of this church because it's actually quite unusual. Um, Anglican churches don't tend to plant churches as a rule. They tend to, I mean, they did sort of hundreds of years ago, uh, and, um, but now they tend to just sort of you know, sort of, carry, sort of either carry on or not carry on. Those are the sort of, those are the sort of two options that, that tend to be on the table for an Anglican church. And, and, you know, for me, that's not really where I'm at um, with regards to the church. I don't believe that God's purpose for his church is that it either carries on or doesn't. God's purpose is that we see, we see a growing um, evidence of the new creation coming as churches are planted and, and, and express that to the community around them. So church planting is what, was what you do. Um, in the last couple of years, because of church planting, the average number of people worshipping in the three churches that have been planted, which is St. Paul's here um, seven years ago, and then All Hallows Bow, where Chris and Becky are, and the team there, and St. Peter's Bethnal Green, where Adam and Heather and their team went. Um, the average number of, of people worshipping in those three churches was 46 um, seven years ago. And at the start of 2012, the average number was 346 or 364, somewhere around the 300 and somethings, okay, which is an increase of 630%. That's, that's the growth that we've seen, and praise God for that. And church planting is, is key to that. It's because we want to see more disciples and more communities transformed that we believe God has given us a burden to plant more churches. Does that make sense? 
So church planting is what you do. And as we think about St. Luke's, I feel that there's, there's three things that you might like to do here today. Like I said at the start, I believe that God is going to call some of you to come with Fuzz and I and, um, and our family as we go to the Isle of Dogs. And, and that's exciting. Um, and I just encourage you to be open to what the Lord is saying uh, and as to whether God is putting his sort of hand on your life and saying, this is a step of faith that I'd love you to take. Um, but as you think about that, here's three options for you. Think about claiming your inheritance. The first thing I'd love for us all to do is to pray for the church plants. Is just be lifting it up in prayer. Um, we've got four months now uh, to prepare for the church plant. And uh, the bishop's going to come along in January. The date will come out in, in uh, the next couple of weeks. But it's going to be sometime in January. And he'll license me to St. Luke's to, to lead the church. And between now and then, I'd love for you to be praying. Can you pray for, uh, for that place, for the Isle of Dogs, for the people who live there, and for the different dynamics that are going on in that community, a place of huge change, where there's massive redevelopment taking place, which is probably a really good thing, um, because uh, the Isle of Dogs has been a really kind of tough place for many, many years, but it's also a really threatening thing for the people who've lived there for many years and who are worried about what that means for them. So pray for that community. And can I ask you to pray for Fuzz and, and for me and for our family as well as we prepare to go, that God would provide us a home to live in. Um, we're absolutely confident that, that God's got the right place for us, but we're not quite sure where that is yet. So um, we'd love you to pray for us and um, for God to fill us with his Holy Spirit as we, as we prepare to lead the, the plant. And also pray for that gathering process as people sort of have a look and, and try out the, uh, the team and whether they're going to be a part of the planting team as well. So please do pray, that's the first thing. And secondly, uh, I'd love you to, to think about whether you can provide for us as a church plant as going from here. Like I said, church planting is a little bit pricey. Actually, it's great value for money. Um, if, you, if, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking in, in eternal terms... Um, if you're thinking about, it's absolutely awful value for money. I'm not going to, I mean, I'm not going to mince words. It's terrible value for money in human speaking. Um, there's much better ways of doing it. But in eternal terms, there is nothing that can, there's nothing that can beat sowing into the kingdom of God. And that's the way Paul talks about giving financially. He says, you know, you can, you can spend money on earthly things, but you can also spend money on things that will last forever. And you get an absolutely incredible return on that. And um, Rick's going to be speaking more in a few weeks' time about giving to the vision of the church. And part of that vision will mean giving to uh, St. Luke's. So I would love you to pray about whether you, you'd like to provide for us as we go from here. But the third option is to plant. I'd love you to pray. I'd love you to think about providing. But I'd love you to... Let the Lord speak to you about planting as well. Is God putting it on your heart to come with us? I was going to kind of make this all, you know, give you lots of different application points at this point and say, you know, does it mean this for you? And apply it in different ways in your life. But Rick said, no, don't do that. Just say to people, come on, do you want to come? So I'm just going to say that. Um, do you feel God's calling you to come with us? We're praying for between 20 and 30 adults and then however many kids um, come as well, at least four, because we've got four. And uh, they definitely, they're definitely they all coming, whether they want to or not. I think they're going to miss Children's Church, but hey. But we're praying for that sort of number, 20 to 30. And ask the Lord whether you're a part of that number and whether God is calling you to take that step of faith to come and help claim that inheritance that we believe God's giving us. We all want to have a legacy. We all want to make a difference with the way that we live. You know, it's, it's been all over our national consciousness. The, the whole point of the Olympics has been not just to see great athletes in action, although inspiring that, that, that has been. It's been to leave a legacy. 
And the legacy has been about inspiring a generation. We all want to make a difference. We want to have a legacy and, and leave a legacy. But on the other hand, if we're honest, we all want to have a rest. We're all thinking it's all very well, kind of saying, come on, let's go and do it. Let's get on with it. Let's get out there. But on the other hand, we're also thinking life's pretty full on. Life's pretty intense. I'm knackered. Um, I'd like a rest. And, it's, and the problem is those things tend to be mutually incompatible. Either you're going for a legacy, you want to make a difference, and you're exhausting yourself, or you're resting so much that you're not really getting very much done. How can you experience both those things? Well, I'd like to suggest that it's by being where God wants you to be. And it's by doing the things that will lead to the kingdom of God breaking out more in your life and in the world around you. Because it was Caleb's experience. Caleb was there. He was claiming his inheritance. He was claiming his legacy. But he was also there to come into God's rest. Look at the last verse that um, Inga read to us. 14, uh, verse 15. Then the land had rest from war. The land had rest. It was because Caleb was decided he was going to go for it and he was going to claim that which had been promised, that he was able to come and experience the rest of God. For me, that's encouraging as well as challenging because I've heard that church planting is exhausting. Just look at Rick. But I also know that there's nothing better than being in the place where God is calling you to be because then you can claim that which God is giving you and you will experience the rest of God, the peace of God. And my prayer for us is that as we prepare to plant a church to St. Luke's in January, God will raise up a group of people who feel passionate about making a difference, about seeing the kingdom of God breaking out more in their own lives and also in the community around them, but are also there because they know God's calling them and they will know the peace of God as they go. They won't burn out. They'll experience the peace of God because they'll be where God wants them to be. Shall we pray together?